they woke us up in the early hours of the morning in Soweto. And when they got there, uh, they, you know, came in big numbers. And they woke us up and they started searching our home. And my husband got very angry with them to see why, why the disturbance. And, you know, they were pulling things, wanting to find papers and all that. I, I think it was before five o'clock in the morning. And eventually, after they've searched and took certain pictures and, and, and some papers, then they took me with, and they took me with to go to our offices. And our offices were in Koto House in De Villiers Street. And when we got there, it was very early. It was about six o'clock in the morning. And the men who was working the night shift there must have been very brilliant because when they said they want to go into the office, he said the door was locked and we cannot go in. And we sat there waiting for morning to, for time to people to arrive who will come and open because he was a security man. Unfortunate for the security men, who I, I, I really respect up until today, he knew that the door wasn't locked. And then unfortunately, someone from inside walked out and opened the door and they got very mad with him because they saw that the door was not locked. And then they went into our offices, our office, and they searched my offices our offices as a whole, they searched, they searched, they searched. And by that time, people had already started coming to work. Now, all the SACC staff was now ready and coming to work. And by the time when they'd finished searching our offices and they were now taking me away, I think they were taking me to number four. And... Uh, the people came out and they stopped the car, that the car that is not going to move because uh, they wanted everyone to come out of the building. And they came out of the building and they started singing Kosi Sigelela e Africa. And I was inside there, handcuffed, and they couldn't move the car and by the time when they finished singing Kosisigeleli Africa. Then they pushed them away and they moved along and then they drove with me and came to, what's the prison? In, in, in John Foster. John Foster, yeah. And as I came into John Foster, I was so nervous, I thought I'm the only one. And as I walked in, there was Neil. And Neil said to me, good morning, Emma. And I never greeted back from shock, I think. And I regret it until this day to say Neil spoke to me and I never spoke back to Neil. Little did I know that I won't see Neil again. I started work in 1956 on the 9th of November as a garment worker. It was in Hanoxburg, which produced uniforms from land, air, and sea people. I missed out with the much of the women in 1956 because I was highly expectant. I was married and I was living in Orlando West, which things, it's where things were happening. That's where my home was. So that's why I knew about it. And 
well, I think my baby didn't leave. And then on November the 9th, I went straight to the union, to the Government Workers' Union headed by Lucy Vubelo, and they referred me to this factory. And when I got there to this factory, it's my first time to work, and it was quite late in my, in my years. Most of the workers were black workers, yeah. And the supervisors were obviously white, and um, it wasn't long after um, job reservation, yeah. And uh, there were certain jobs which you could still see that these are now reserved for white people. Like sewing around the sleeve of a jacket. It was reserved for white persons. And uh, from then on, it was reserved for men. For men, you know, you could be a black man, but not, but not for women. And you just don't know what the difference was. Just sewing around the sleeve of a jacket, I can't tell what the difference was, what, what, why it was so difficult. Once you are in the factory, you, you knew that you've got to, to be very productive. You've got to, and people used to, I, 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 I used to love, do lots of mistakes, you know. I, I wasn't very productive. I don't know why I was nervous. And I, until I was made like a supervisor, much as I wasn't productive, I was made like a supervisor. And I worked there for a long time, acting as a supervisor, but until the inspectors at one time found out that I am actually supervising from the industrial council. And when the inspectors came, um, the employers tried to say that I'm an assistant supervisor but actually there was no one I am assisting on the floor. And eventually at that time, uh, the employers chose to say they will pay me for the work that I am doing. But at that time I chose not to be paid and said I want the title of being a supervisor so that it should break the, the eyes of people not being called supervisors. I was elected to be a shop steward. The workers wanted me to be a shop steward. And it was so, so impossible because now I'm like a supervisor at the same time. And now doing both these jobs, I, I thought the workers won't trust me. But I, I, I still, I'm still very proud that the workers had confidence in me with all that. And I was a shop steward for the whole time until I was on the executive of the National Council of the, 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 the Union itself. And I did both these jobs. And we were going out on strike on several times. One time we went out on strike for a penny because in order as to qualify for your unemployment insurance, you had to be earning 10 rand 51 cents a week. But we were earning 10 rand 50 cents, and therefore we went out on strike. And we were going out on strike for a number of things, you know, for an ill treatment of a worker would go out on strike for, you know, the manner in which management or supervisors handled people who would go out on strike. Maybe this is why the title of my book was Strikes Have Followed Me All My Life, because we were but striking most of the time in order as to have communication with management to settle the problem. Because we never went to court, I, I wouldn't say this is the reason 
why we were arrested. But the impression I have is that, and which was not a wrong one, we were now dealing with matters where we were training workers about being self-sufficient, and I was working very closely with Neil Agat. And we wanted the, the market, where, where it's now the marketplace where, yeah, when the market closed there, we were planning to have that place as a training center for the workers. And I, I don't find anything wrong in that, but I, I think government got suspicious that we were doing something which is unbecoming. And that was the main reason I believe we were detained. Well, we all were in different places of detention. You didn't know where it was. But just there at John Foster, uh, there was a man who was standing next to Bibles. Yeah. And now, before we go to our places of being locked up, this man asks me, as they are call me, and I'm not very good at Afrikaans, and I said, yes, I am a komi, because I thought he meant, are you a communicant? Because he's standing next to Bibles. So I, I wanted a Bible to say, I said, yes, I guess I am a komi. And he said, indeed you are. And there were other people who were there, who I later recalled were the employers for Allied Publishing, who we've had several strikes and problems with, they were there. And well, when I went to my, where I was locked up, I did not have a Bible because I said I'll be me. Yeah, so I don't know when Neil was locked up. I never, you never knew where any one person is locked up. So I was locked up in JP Police Station. And after a very long time, when we were there one day, someone said to me, well, the police woman, they were saying to me, we, they, will, they will bring me a newspaper. They started smuggling the Rand Daily Mail for me. And no, that was before Neil died. One time, one woman came in and said to me, and didn't say anything, was in a uniform and opened the door. And when he opened the door of the cell, this was a very dirty cell. The cell itself and the wall was written so many ugly things, like Vasifo, Mort, like Vasifo, Kartsil, like Vasifo, what? You know, all those kind of things. And now I wanted to clean the wall. And yes, I started cleaning because it was torturing me. And then this woman came in and locked the door behind herself and took off the police uniform. And underneath the police uniform came a church uniform, Methodist church uniform. And he said, let us pray, kneel, let us pray. And well, I did kneel, but I didn't pray. I wasn't sure what she's doing. And she said she could see that I am getting weaker and weaker. And after that, she put on her uniform and went out. From then on, I started getting information until one day I got information that Neil was was dead. And I think I must have lost it in my mind. I, I, I couldn't, I didn't take it well at all. I can't recall the details very well. But when we came out of prison, Liz Floyd was also one of the people who was detained and who was a fiancé of Neil Agat. So I asked Liz to say, Liz, when we were now out, Liz, I'm... I want to go and visit Neil's grave. And Liz couldn't understand what for, why, Emma? 
I said, I must, I must go and visit Neil's grave. So you organize your friends who know where Neil has been buried. And then Liz did it for my, in my favor. But when it did happen, the day when we went to Neil's grave, Liz was there. She came with plants, you know, little pot plants. And when we got to the grave, the African I am, I had to. I did my prayers, you know, and so forth. But by the time when we were supposed to leave, Liz was now so attached that she didn't want to leave. She was the one now who was sitting there digging and so forth. And after that, she said, Emma, I feel so much better. It did something for her as well, which I felt good about it. The main purpose for interrogation, they said, who is giving me the, f who is feeding me with the information? It doesn't come from me that I would say we want to have a training college. It's, it's socialist. It's, it's, it's there, there's someone who's feeding me with the information. And I had no one to point it, you know. But strange that for, for, for a, a number of years, every time when the 9th of November came, no, the, the whatever date we were detained, but it was in November, I used to get a blackout on that day. I'm very proud of that period, very proud of that period to say that we started from that foundation until we formed the giant that is Kosatu today by collecting subscriptions from the gates, from every other union place everywhere, and then rush and still take it to the union offices. And this money would not disappear. I wonder what would happen today. But the unions were so efficient that um, we built very strong unions with that collection of subscriptions of one rand at the gate or one rand fifty. There are things that you, you'd want to see. In our struggle, we were doing much better than what it is right now. I mean, health care. As a union, we had doctors that would cater for us. And it's diminishing. It's not there now. It's, it, everything is it's just going down, 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 down. And you wonder why. I am always so grateful that I was there at that time and not envious of seeing it should have been now. Because in comparison, I, I, I think we have a lot to boast about. We have a lot to say about we've built a very good foundation than what one sees is happening now. People are very materialistic as compared to those times. No one wanted to be poor. We were fighting against poverty, uh, but you didn't want to outshine the other person. We were like family. We, you, you wanted unity and you wanted equality. We were fighting for equality to say we must not be outshined by any other person. There must be equality. <laughs>